we have got a great next session here for you. We've got two amazing speakers followed by a fireside chat which will uh, serve as the Q&A for both of them after uh, both talks have, have concluded. So to begin, it is my pleasure to introduce Professor George Church. He is a professor of genetics at the Harvard Medical School and also the director of personalgenomes.org, which provides the world's only open access information on human genomic, environmental, and trait data. Going back to 1984, his Harvard PhD included the first methods for direct genome sequencing, molecular multiplexing, and barcoding. His work led to the first genomes, genome sequence of the pathogen H. pylori, which was completed in 1994, and to the nearly 20-year Human Genome Project, which was completed in 2003. His innovations have contributed to nearly all next-generation DNA sequencing methods and companies. This, plus his lab's work on chip DNA synthesis, gene editing, and stem cell engineering, resulted in founding additional application-based companies spanning the fields of medical diagnostics and synthetic biology-based therapeutics. He has also pioneered new privacy, biosafety, environmental, and biosecurity policies. He is a director of an IARPA brain project and the NIH Center for Excellence in Genomic Science. He has been elected to the National Academy of Science and the National Academy of Engineering. He is a Franklin Bauer Laureate for Achievement in Science, and he has co-authored 425 papers, 95 patent applications, and one book titled Regenesis. To speak today about CRISPR, please welcome Professor George Church. So it's great to be here. Uh, and uh, looking forward to the panel. I have a great deal of uh, uh, alignment with Kevin uh, Esfeld, who will be right after me, uh, but I'm not going to s say any of that. You, you can just imagine that I'm saying it when he says it. Uh, I'm going to try to talk about, and I'm going to talk a little bit more broadly than just CRISPR. I'm talking about technologies for uh, global effective altruism. And the technology, CRISPR is really just a tiny piece of it, and you'll see in a moment just how tiny and limited it is uh, relative to other things that we have and are developing. So I'm going to put this in the context of things that we think these molecular technologies can have impact on things that are decidedly um, beyond molecular, like global warming and eradication of infections, um, the ability to have ubiquitous genome reading, 724 real time, uh, always on your body, and genome writing for pathogen resistance, um, inherited diseases, um, and then existential earth risks. So for global warming, it, it probably, hopefully all of you know that the tundra soil is in danger. It has uh, more carbon in the tundra uh, soil and forests than in the atmosphere and the tropical forests put together as if they were. Um, and there are three, three approaches that, that I like that have uh, something to do with the technologies that I work on, which is alternatives to meat, uh, virus-resistant cyanobacteria so that the carbon can be sequestered, and then keystone species such as the ones at the bottom here to reduce the soil temperature uh, and keep the carbon in place. Again, more carbon than all those other sources of carbon put together. Now, uh, meat has not just global warming issues, it has antibiotic issues, zoonotic disease issues, and cholesterol. Um, it, there's about a 23 to 1 calorie conversion issue. There's a lot of fresh water and surface of the earth used, and it is number one emitter of greenhouse gases. Uh, here are some of the companies uh, that are involved in um, producing alternatives, and some of these are literally meat. They're just uh, 23 times less expensive and less consumptive of resources. Now, this brings us to ways that we can engineer uh, various uh, food sources and other sources, and you're all aware of one of the, of the public relations issues with some of this, but we need to be able to reduce pesticide, herbicide, fungicide, uh, water and fertilizer use, and get all these other advantages, uh, adaption, ad ad adaptation to a variety of things that may be the result of global warming before we get it back under control. But we have this problem with genetically modified organisms uh, where 
uh, you know, if you ask uh, uh, average citizen, they might prefer to have random mutation um, versus transgenic. And then there's a third option, which I think is quite interesting. It hasn't been explored very much, uh, both in public discussion and, and even scientifically, which is what we call cisgenic. So transgenic is moving genes from one organism to another, and that's what the organic trade organization defines a GMO as moving that uh, genetic material from another species, and they actually define species. They also, uh, other um, organizations define the problem with uh, Genetic engineering is the creation of things like allergens, and, and uh, you, you, we know that we have a bigger, uh, say, peanut allergen problem than ever before, and here's some of the proteins involved in that. And, uh, and you could uh, imagine that ra the, the, the allergens that we have are the consequence of random mutations, both in the, in the peanut and in uh, the human genome. While the, the cisgenic, where you're moving around uh, material that, in, say, changing a G to an A inside the genome, um, is a natural process, but it has advantages over random mutations in that you're, you're not going to be creating allergens. You might even be uh, removing the allergens from the, uh, very, in a very targeted way. So I think cisgenic has a great potential, not only because it, it allows us to do things in a more controlled way than transgenics, but also it may be less uh, alarming and less regulated uh, in, a, in a good way. And so there's 30 GMOs that already sidestepped the USDA, and they're also uh, being uh, uh, proposed in, in Europe, which is one of the, and these include uh, waxy corn, and white button mushroom, and uh, not yet golden rice, but I think golden rice is a, a terrific uh, test bed for this because a million people die each year from vitamin A deficiency. And uh, current golden rice is transgenic, but I think it could be made cisgenically because the beta carotene is made um, in, in other parts of the, of the rice plant, just to need to move around the regulatory sequences within the genome. So I'm going to pose a question. This is kind of audience participation, if you want. Uh, I'm, I'm just going to bull ahead, though. Um, what health technology is available equally to all people in the world? And I don't mean by this that, that uh, you know, that it's pretty good. I mean, really equally. Um, so I'll start listing things that are not equally distributed, although better, much better than ever before. Um, water. Seems like everybody has access to water, but not everybody has access to clean water. Um, food. Yes, they have food. Um, even the starving ones have some access to food, but that's the point, is it's not equally distributed. Um, in terms of nutrition, and I already mentioned a million people die of vitamin A deficiency. Um, they don't even have access, equal access to vaccines, but what they do have is once the vaccines do their job, some of these things go extinct. And so we have uh, smallpox is the most famous one. Uh, Rinderpest is an animal um, uh, vaccination. Po two polioviruses, two and three, are extinct as of 2012, as far as we know. And then there's a long list of things down here that, 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 that scientists feel uh, could be extinct. Um, and then once they're extinct, uh, you might want to continue to vaccinate, um, but uh, they're gone, um, and everybody benefits from it, whether or not they have access to vaccines. Which brings us to um, monitoring. We want to be able to do better surveillance than we do right now. I think it is, we will look back, hopefully very soon, on our current era and think of it as very quaint time where we were blind to infectious agents. As we walk through in this room, I can see clouds of pathogens coming from your, some of you, and, uh, <laughs> and you're all blind. You can't actually see whether it is simp a simple sneeze uh, due to an allergy, which is non-infectious, or a sneeze that, that to which I am immune, or a sneeze to which none of us are immune and is uh, going to cause um, existential risk. Um, but there is a handheld device shown here, um, which is almost real time. It means that within about 25 minutes of sample uh, being placed on it, you're getting data that tells you uh, that tells you DNA sequence, and so you can and it can be hooked up to databases. I think we're moving in a direction where this can get faster, less delay between the sample and the readout. It's going to be hooked up to the internet and the internet of things, and you will know uh, before you even walk into this room what other people are detecting 
uh, and you can decide for yourself whether it's a good place for your particular genome to be. This is just kind of a, 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 a montage of some of the data and uh, images from this, and we're not going to go through the, the science here, but the point is these are single nanomachines that we've harvested from the world. We've actually created a synthetic construct, which is unusual, a polymerase fused to a pore uh, that were not normally together in nature. They've been engineered together, and so this is a, a machine that's literally on the order of a nanometer, um, and it does amazing things. It will capture the DNA out of solution. It'll run it through like a stepper motor, it will, uh, and it will read out one base at a time, and that's what those four greens and four red uh, A's and, and four blue T's, that's actual data at a picoampere level, um, and it's, and it's uh, getting more and more accurate and faster and faster. And you can have, uh, in a square centimeter, probably eight million different sequencing devices. It used to be a sequencing device would be bigger than this podium. Um, now you can get 8 million of them on a square centimeter. So, and that is reflected in this, I think, uh, awe-inspiring uh, uh, plot, which is a logarithmic plot. So on the y-axis, you have factors of 10. And you see this sort of this hockey stick behavior that some people associate with, with a exponential. That's a linear, linear plot. This is a this actually has factors of 10. So when it changes slope, that means you're getting a super exponential. It's going faster and faster. So we had something that happened around 2003, and I think another uh, change in slope in the, in the positive direction is happening about now. And what I, what I argue would hap happened in 2003, 2004 was miniaturization and multiplexing. And by multiplexing, I mean that, you know, the same thing you have going through optical fibers, that you can mix a lot of different, in this case, samples into one tube. So it's rather than doing, having a, a robot doing a billion pipettings, you put all billion samples into one tube, and now one pipetting does a billion reactions. So that's uh, far more efficient. And, and to some extent, automation was secondary to all that. The big revolution was the miniaturization and multiplexing. Now, that exponential I showed you was a three million-fold improvement in reading DNA and a billion-fold improvement in writing DNA into short oligos. By contrast, the topic that I'm supposed to be covering here, CRISPR, is a modest improvement over previous technology. It is a fourfold improvement over the previous technology, which is called talons. And we already had the ability to do tens of thousands uh, of uh, different talons. Um, so modest, the emphasis on modest. And I'll tell you what's wrong with it in a moment. We made these libraries, I'm not gonna go through them. CRISPR originated it's doing something technologically that's very different from what it was doing biologically. Biologically, there were two components. One is surveillance, where it's looking, it's, it's, it's looking at nucleic acids coming into the bacterial cell. This is an evolutionary time frame. And then it has the, the part that we're excited about uh, is the Cas9, which does the antiviral action, a combination of the guide RNA, which binds to the, the viral DNA. So this is all antiviral. We've turned it into a device that uh, damages um, DNA, um, which we call editing. Um, I want to distinguish between precise editing and, um, and random damage, but I'll, I'll, I'll get to that in a moment. And so this, ev this evolved from junk DNA. It was junk DNA by every definition. It was repetitive, it was not conserved, and it didn't affect proteins. And those, those used to be the definition of junk DNA, but it turned out to be anything but junk uh, in 2013, it turned into a technology, and you can see here, with a computer, you can program 20 bases of RNA that are specific to the, the you're finding a needle in a haystack. You've got six billion base pairs in your genome, A, C's, G's, and T's. These 20 base pairs will find a unique place if you, the computer has done its job, and, uh, and then make a double-strand break. The cell then has two options to what to do with that double-strand break. Uh, it can do what you really want, which is homologous recombination, or HR, which is a precise editing. And it will do non-homologous enjoining, which is usually a mess of insertion, random insertions and deletions, which some people still um, call editing. Um, I, I call that genome vandalism, but whatever. And CRISPR is not the only editor. There are nine different molecular editors. Um, Three of them, rec three of them rec use DNA to go scanning along the, 
the six billion base pairs and find the one place you want to cut. So there's a DNA interact, a single strand of DNA interact with double strand of DNA typically, and uh, and scanning. And it's scanning quite randomly. It'll it it, it does it is not like a guided missile. It's like finding uh, it's trying a place. It's the, the wrong place. It goes it goes scanning. It comes back and tries the wrong place again. So it's very random, but it, when it finds the right place, it knows it cuts. So three of them use uh, DNA, two of them use RNA, and four of them use protein to find the needle in a haystack place to bind. And the, thi the main thing about this slide is I've divided it up into two universes. Uh, the, the, the one on the left uh, have this unfortunate tendency to make non-homologous end joining because uh, they, don't, they don't pair the DNA um, before they cut. And then, the, and then the ones on the right are um, ones that uh, have close to 0% of the unwanted non-homologous enjoining. So there are two issues that you'll, you'll run across in the literature, um, or in the news for that matter. One is off-target and the other is on-target issues. And I don't want to get down in the weeds here, but the off-target issues are mostly handled by co proper computational analysis, choosing that 20-mer well, not, so that, not only so that it's on-target, but you scan the entire genome. So the thing that's often neglected in this is the key technology in editing is actually reading the genome. You need to know your genome. Uh, and then we can do single base specific and we can do clonal analysis. Then there are on-target issues, and I already mentioned that, that I divided the world into this, those that, that require pairing before they do any um, homologous recombination. Now we use those, those latter ones, the, this is a, the biggest genome engineering projects in the world are not CRISPR based, they're based on these, on these methods that uh, don't make double strand breaks, but they require pairing before you do uh, elegant uh, recombination. And these two uh, are industrial microorganisms, E. coli and yeast, and they um, involved uh, three main goals. One is uh, the ability to do biocontainment, genetic and metabolic isolation, and then to use new biochemistry, non-standard amino acids. And the, and, the, and the biggest one, I think, is this multivirus resistance. The concept, I think, is very profound, is that you can make an organism, a cell, completely resistant to all viruses, including viruses you've never even seen before. And you can do that because despite their diversity, vi viruses have something in common, which they expect the cell to provide them with a genetic code. And if you can, you can change that genetic code in a way that's healthy for the cell and very unhealthy for the viruses. But you, it requires you have to engineer every single uh, gene in the cell. This is improving exponentially, just like everything else I've mentioned and will mention in this talk. It's all exponential, uh, sometimes super exponential. This particular case, we're, we're really moving from editing to writing. We've gotten, and the same thing is happening as with reading. It used to be a big deal to read like 20 base pairs, just to read it. That would be a whole thesis. Um, now we read an entire genome of 6 billion base pairs just to check on one base. You know, you change a base and you say, well, I better check that base, and you sequence the whole thing. Um, and the students think nothing of this at this point. And the th same thing, I think, is happening with writing, where we want to change the base, we change the whole genome. And uh, one of our, our sort of flagship pilot projects is what we call uh, Genome Project Write. The, the genome project that you've probably heard about is reading the genome. Now we're writing the genome. We're doing this in human cells to make them ultra safe for manufacturing and therapies. Um, when you manufacture with, with mammalian cells and they get infected by viruses, it can wipe out the factory for two years. This happened here in our local Genzyme uh, factory. So we want to make these human cells virus resistant. And it could be, uh, in addition to manufacturing, we could use these as therapies in stem cells or transplantation. If you have a choice, you'd prefer to have a transplantation with cells that are resistant to viruses, to prions, to senescence, to um, cancer and so on. And this, this is all on our to-do list for the cell line that we're, they're already beginning to construct. It's only about five times harder to make a virus, uh, five times more codons than the ones we've already made in uh, E. coli where we changed four, billion, four million base pairs. So the other thing we'd like to do is, and we are already doing, is we're either using editing or writing to deal with inherited diseases which affect about 5% of births worldwide, slightly higher number in, in countries with inbreeding. And, eat, and it, of these 5%, they either die very young or they uh, have a lifetime cost of, of $20 million because these are very serious diseases and often 
one or both parents have to give up their normal job to, to, to be caretakers. We have two approaches. One is gene therapy and the other is figuring out whether these, are by cause and effect, uh, which of these new diseases are impactful. And in order to, um, to do a lot of this research, we need to have properly consented cells. And we have uh, the first, um, uh, or the only worldwide uh, example um, of uh, cells and DNA and data which are shareable, which, are, which have been properly consented um, with a, 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 a a lot of ethics consultation and thinking out of the box for uh, including uh, new ideas about re-identification and commercial use. Um, and this was recognized by two uh, important government agencies, the National Institute of Standard Technology and the Food and Drug Administration, um, where they produced the first uh, international standards for, for genomes called Genome in a Bottle. Uh, and. Uh, and they looked around the world for p potential uh, cohorts, and they found only one cohort had been properly um, consented for this, this sort of application. This cohort is now international with uh, components in the United States, uh, Canada, uh, England, Austria, and Korea. And it's, pr and it's been used in many. Now, another aspect, of the, and I'm wrapping up here, uh, is the uh, Another aspect of the sharing is, and on the theme of CRISPR, um, sometimes CRISPR has uh, a reputation for being, um, uh, how should I say it, uh, less than ideal uh, camaraderie uh, due to patent fights. Um, but on the other hand, I, I, you know, I see the, the half full or maybe even completely full cup, um, which is that uh, most of the CRISPR therapeutic companies are within a few blocks of each other here in Cambridge. Um, four of them uh, um, from the upper right, Editas, eGenesis, Intellia, and CRISPR Therapeutics. And embedded in their midst is a nonprofit organization called AdGene, which I am very excited about. And AdGene has been, since well before CRISPR, distributing plasmids uh, worldwide. And they have um, such a large, uh, they, they essentially distribute these technologies at cost, just the cost of, of storing and shipping, um, and they have such a large demand that, as I understand it, they're one of the largest users of both the U.S. Postal, no, UPS and uh, FedEx in, in, um, in Massachusetts. And down below are the names of 133 laboratories. These are not just individuals, but lab, whole laboratories that are, uh, have deposited their um, plasmids, showing that they're building on top of the original CRISPR te technology we developed in 2013, and they're, and they're all sharing it in a way um, that we can keep going faster and faster. So that is uh, the state of the art for sharing of CRISPR. We have genetically modified uh, humans. Some people are surprised to hear that these people are walking around already. Um, and, and it is because there are 2,400 approved clinical trials for gene therapy. Uh, gene therapy had a rocky start in around 1999 to 2000. There were three individuals that died in two trials, and so that put a kind of a, a strong hold on it for 10 years. But there's, uh, they're, they're beginning to get approved, and many of them are, are looking good in the pipeline. They are a little expensive because of their rare or orphan drugs, but there's a growing number that will be applicable to everyone, which will make them possibly the, the least expensive and safest drugs, but time will tell. Um, and we have to constantly contrast this or keep in mind that there is an alternative for some of these, which is genetic counseling, which is very inexpensive. It's less than $1,000 for a whole genome. So uh, there was a recent report from the National Academy of Sciences, with long awaited, it was uh, two years in the making, and uh, I think to some people's surprise, but I think, I think it was very well researched and, and art well articulated, is they came, they said that there were reasons why you might use germline therapy. There was a lot of talk about moratoria before this report, there's been very little talk since then, and they said that as long as there is, uh, this is the only alternative and there is, it prevents a serious disease and there's a lot of long-term oversight, then 
gene therapy is, a, is definitely an option. And I would add to the, and I did add to this long, have long ago, is that contrary to the way it's normally formulated or framed, is that, that, the, the, um, that you would be harming embryos, you would be doing the gene, the uh, editing or gene therapy on embryos. An alternative is you could do it on the precursors for the gametes, the eggs and sperm, and that could allow, that could be done in a way that you check the editing before you produce any gametes, and you can have essentially perfect solving the on-target, off-target problem and eliminating harm to any embryos, which is in stark contrast to the current medical practice, the approved medical practice, which is typically abortion or in vitro fertilization, which some people consider is also uh, embryo loss. So finally, this is the last slide. Um, um, Earth is um, dying, not just because of global warming, but because an asteroid and a supervolcano are headed our way, um, which have caused uh, grand extinctions, extinctions in the past. And the only real way of avoiding this is getting uh, backing up our planet, uh, the humans, uh, on another, other planets. Mars here is 38% Earth gravity, and we are ill-equipped for that. It causes um, loss of calcium for the bones, um, which have uh, ramifications for the, our kidneys, for our uh, inner ear, um, uh, neuropsych effects, and so forth. There's also radiation problems, I think, although I think gravity is the big one. And there's issues of contamination. We actually we have an international agreement not to contaminate the planets um, with germs, um, and that's pretty pretty challenging because we're full of germs. But it turns out, uh, despite the excitement about having our having microbiomes, uh, we actually don't need microbiomes for life. Um, they're, they're somewhat helpful, but they're germ-free chickens, goats, mice, a lot of different uh, organisms can be germ-free, including humans. And that is uh, it. Um, I think we might have, well, we're going to definitely have a discussion in the panel. If you have a burning question right now, we have a, a, you know, a minute or so. Um, thank you. So I've got two that have come in uh, just for you, and then we'll save the rest for okay. the, uh, the discussion in a little bit. Oh. So the first one, how does the recent paper on CRISPR causing unwanted yeah. in vivo mutations affect your view of its prospects for treating okay. all sorts of things? Right. So uh, maybe some of you have seen the news. It made a lot, a big splash. Uh, uh, it was uh, um, we have now put on BioArchive a critique of this paper. Uh, I, I've actually been one of the strongest uh, and and my co-founders at Editas uh, have been some of the strongest uh, uh, voices of caution about uh, off-target uh, cutting uh, uh, and on-target that, that I described here. But this paper is actually not, not probably not correct. Uh, I, I, I rarely say that about a published paper, and it's, it's a perfectly legitimate group at Stanford. Um, but I think they, they were relatively inexperienced at uh, inbred mouse brains and sequencing. And they, the control that they did, they compared CRISPR-treated mice with mice of the same inbred strain. And the problem is that in other experiments in other labs, when you compare two mice from the same inbred strain, they should be identical. They're like identical twins. Well, in fact, they have a thousand differences um, at the single nucleotide variation level. And so probably what they described as CRISPR-related single nucleotide variation was just variation within the inbred population. The, the way they should have done the experiment is compare the parents to the offspring rather than the offspring to another member of the, colon, of the mouse colony. Gotcha. Okay, second but, question but, for but the But time will tell. I mean, I'm, 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 you know, it's a critique. It's not, I, I, don't, yeah. I don't know, but they, they, they need to do the correct experiment. Somebody needs to, yeah. Uh, second question from the moment. What are, what is the state of and what are the best prospects for economically efficient full genome writing technology? Yeah, say it again. So what, what is the current state of full genome writing and what, are, what is the uh -huh. kind of trend Got there? It. Okay. So you know, I, I, I gave a, a slide where we have two genome, two industrial microorganisms that are sort of the four megabase uh, scale that are still in the process of being debugged. So I wouldn't, they're not finished products, but they're getting very close. 
Um, and they have, and they, and they produce interesting new properties. So it's not sufficient just to kind of, you know, make um, cosmetic changes or, or, or no changes. Uh, these are, the, the more changes you make in order to make something that's industrially useful or, or edu you know, or educate us about biology, the more changes you make, the, the harder it is to debug. Um, moving that into, so what we have in, in mammals is a growing set of tools, uh, and the whole point of the Genome Project Right is develop tools to bring this exponential cost down so that we think nothing of going from a computer file, computer-aided design, to, to synthetic genomes. Um, you know, I think the mammal, uh, the pilot project, uh, it's about five times more codons it will probably take you know, a few years. Awesome. How about another round of applause to Professor George Church? <laughs>